One of the most common questions I get is, what does it take to maintain a garden of this size? I don't really have a good answer for that, but today I figured let's walk through the garden and do a variety of different tasks. Maybe the unsung heroes of gardening maintenance that you usually don't see because they're just not that sexy. So in this video, we're going to be going over how to prune and keep a zucchini plant healthy, how to prune and harvest cucumbers to get the most yield. And also we're going to revisit that chop and drop bed that you guys were all so interested in and plant it out with peppers. I'm also going to actually talk about this question I get the most common probably, which is how do I keep my flowers so dense and tidy? It actually just involves twine and a steak, so you'll probably be thrilled to see how easy that is. But let's get started with these tomatoes over here because I want to do a little maintenance health check and maybe a little bit of supporting on this Florida weave. So I'm going to meet you over there on the beefsteak tomatoes. It's no secret that I'm a huge fan of the Florida weave system, just because it's so easy to support so many tomatoes in a single place. Now, there are some mistakes that I've made here, and one of them is the most common that everyone will make when doing a Florida weave, which is that you don't tie them up often enough. So what ends up happening is that you get the tomatoes spilling over onto different sides, where really you wanna try to maintain them in a vertical plane so they don't get all mixed up and tangled, which causes disease. So let's get inside real close on this guy and show you a little technique that I've developed for skipping the Florida weave if it's too messy and hard to get around while still getting the same results. So here we are on this slicer row of beef steaks. And what I want to try to do here is actually separate out these plants. What they've done is actually collide into each other. So I want to figure out where the stems are of the actual plant that's on this side and the one in the middle and try to keep them a little bit separated. So what we're going to do now is take this twine and create a little bridge across the Florida weave that'll stop these plants from sliding into each other. So now this knot's here. What I'm going to do is take the string to the other side and do the exact same thing there. I could also try to pull this twine in so that this gap closes a little bit but honestly, I don't think it's that necessary at this stage. So I'm gonna close it a little bit, but try to leave it with a little bit of wiggle room. These tomatoes are quite far along and they're actually setting quite a lot of fruit right now. So I don't wanna stress them out too much. So there we go. Now we have this bridge here that'll stop the tomatoes from sliding around and it should stay in their relative spaces. A lot of you asked for a pepper update and here it is. They've clearly surpassed their tunnel, tons of flowers, a lot of really nice branching. I'm already starting to get a decent amount of fruit. Now, as you can see over there, the tomatoes are quite ahead of the peppers, which is totally normal. Tomatoes just grow more vigorously and quicker, and the peppers prefer the more intense heat that summer has to offer. So the other thing you'll notice is that I'm sitting somewhere that's quite shady. This is fantastic for peppers because these tomatoes want as much sun as they can get, but the peppers, while they do want sun, can suffer from sun scald if they get too much of that intense late afternoon sun. So by planting them, on this side of the tomatoes, I ensure that they get plenty of shade in the afternoon, but plenty of morning sun so they could keep on growing without having their peppers burned. Now let's go over to the eggplant where I built a low tunnel using these metal hoops and see how it's looking. And honestly, it's time to just take all these hoops off because we're now so deep into the warm season that I don't really see any reason to keep these on anymore. I can't talk about this eggplant without first mentioning the Martian Jules corn here because it just looks so gosh dang incredible. Now it is starting to both tassel and silk. So we'll have corn uh, in the near future here. It's looking very happy and healthy, but I did not expect this corn to be as vigorous as it was. So the beans that are trying to grow up in this three sisters garden are starting to catch up a little bit, but I think they were caught a little bit off guard. So let's move on from the corn and come back to this eggplant. Cause like I said, it looks really good. It's so full and healthy it's time to remove this cover. So it's only actually been, I think, two weeks since I made that video where I built this hoop cover over it. And the results speak for themselves. This eggplant is absolutely massive now. It's flowering like crazy. The leaves look really healthy. So this little temperature boost that I got from building this hoop house made a huge difference. But now that we're fully in summer and it's been sunny every day, it's time to move on because you don't wanna cook your eggplant before you harvest it. So we're gonna move off this and with that, Let's pop over to the other garden where there's a lot more maintenance and some of those tasks I mentioned. I know you guys wanna see that chop and drop bed finally get planted out. A garden of this size requires a lot of physical labor and with physical labor, oftentimes comes physical pain. And that's why I'm happy to say that today's sponsor is Nature's Willow and their Willow Balm Pain Relieving Cream. They sent a few bottles to us a couple months ago and let's just say this is my second bottle. I've been using it whenever I've been feeling little aches and pains. For example, right now, my shoulder feels weird because I think I slept on it funny. 
And just putting this on can actually help me garden for the rest of the day. And actually, I think it does make it feel better. It's made out of natural ingredients like white willow bark. And I wouldn't talk about it if I didn't actually like it or think that it worked. Because like I said, this is my second bottle. So thanks for sending this along. I'm happy to share it. Great product. Now let's get back to the gardening video. So here we are down here with my Emerald Delight zucchinis. I have two of them in this bed. And these have turned out to be actually be one of my favorite zucchinis that I've grown. Not only does it taste really nice, it has a really firm texture to it. And the plant itself has been much more manageable than I've expected from other zucchinis. So the tip here that I want to focus on is actually how to prune your zucchini, especially when you get to this time of year where powdery mildew really starts to become an issue. The most kind of safe way to prune a zucchini plant especially if you do have powdery mildew, is to remove any leaves off your most current squash. So right here I have my zucchini, and actually this one's ready to harvest, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab it right there. And like I said, it's a wonderful squash, great eating, beautiful variety. But the thing that this plant has is that it has a very open habit. What that means is that the leaves aren't very dense and close together, making it easy to spot the squash, makes it easy for them to get pollinated. It's also very manageable to get in here and prune. So when it comes to pruning for powdery mildew control specifically, you wanna make sure you're removing any of the leaves below the most current fruit, because those are the oldest and they're most likely to have any sort of disease issues. They're also going to be the ones that are likely leaning on the floor, just because they get old and they start to sag a lot more. So I'm gonna pick up the plant here and maybe just prune off one or two more of these, because honestly, the plant seems very healthy. It does have actual uh, powdery mildew resistance and I don't see any powdery mildew on this plant. Now, one thing somebody asked me before is if these uh, sort of weird white spots on the leaves are a sign of disease, and they're not. They're just a natural trait of many different squash plants that have this kind of almost variegated look. So that's it for this guy. I've harvested it out. There's also a, a failed pollination here. And I'll show you what I mean by failed here. So if you take a look at this and you see how it has this dark green color up here and then it fades off to this yellow color, the flower has already wilted away, which means that its chance for pollination is done. This is already done. It can't grow anymore, it can't get any bigger. It's just gonna rot away. It feels very squishy and soft. But once you see this kind of dark to yellow gradation, that means that it's not pollinated and it's honestly trash. So this squash will right itself given enough time and the sunlight. But what I'm going to do instead is take the stake here and just put it here at the base to stop it from rolling over. So just by putting that stake there, it's now upright and it's better able to catch the sun and hopefully produce some more squash for me. So now let's go to the carrot flowers. On an epic homesteading video, Kevin made fun of me for these wonderful, beautiful, amazing carrot flowers. They're absolutely covered in bees. He just doesn't like the pollinators as much as I do, I guess, because let me tell you right now, these are absolutely loaded. <laughs> There's a carrot flower over there with five bees and like three flies on the same flower. So we're going to try to do this gently because I don't want to disturb these guys having their little pollinator field day. And what we're going to do though, is get some twine. This is con butcher's twine. I'm going to tie the carrot flowers off to the fence so I could reclaim this pathway or at least try to. This is something I actually do across a large chunk of my garden. I'll show you in a second how my Shasta daisies look as dense as they do. And it all has to do with twine and a stake every once in a while. So what I'm going to do is come around to this side and just tie off the beginning of the twine onto this fence post here. And I'll just show you how simple it is to tidy up something like giant spillover flowers like these carrots. So I'm literally just tying twine to a stake post or to a fence post right now, and that's it. Okay, so now take my twine and then I'm just going to start gently lifting up these flowers. So now this piece of string here has full control of these plants. If I give it a tug, everything comes up, I get my pathway back, and that's the goal here. So all I'm going to do now is take this twine, figure out where my next fence post is. The nice thing about this too is that you could pull as much tension or as little tension as you want to control how tight your flowers are and the way that they're standing. And actually, while I'm doing this, I'm watching all the bees here and they're not flying away. So they don't seem too mad or disturbed about what I'm doing here. Boom, that easy. Now I have a much more organized garden. I could walk through this pathway again and my carrot flowers are still happy flowering away. Soon I'll collect seeds from these. This was mostly a fun experiment just because carrot flowers just look very whimsical and fun and the pollinators love them. So now let's go over to that Shasta daisy and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Here's my Shasta daisy in all of its glory. It's quite a massive plant now. This is a perennial flower that comes back with a vengeance every year. And this year it's certainly no exception. This is its second year in the ground and it's apparently saved up quite a lot of energy because this is the most insane bloom I have in my garden right now. 
It's absolutely out of control. If I had no support on it, it would take over probably a six foot circle of this garden right here. And actually it might already be doing that as it is. So the way this works is very similar to the previous method where you have twine wrapped up against it to keep everything upright. And this is actually a technique I use across my entire garden. And it's actually a question you guys ask a lot is how I get my flowers to look so dense and sort of compact. And it's all twine and stakes. So the way this one here is set up is it has some paracord wrapped around the perimeter of the Shasta Daisy. And then it goes up into the center where I've actually hidden a U post. All I did is hammer this U post into the center of the plant and I'm using it to anchor this twine to keep this whole plant upright. So right now, as you can see, it's actually taking up quite a bit of space. So what I'm going to do right now is actually pull some of this twine back and tighten it up a little bit because I want it to be a little bit more compact. It's starting to encroach on my cucumbers over there. So I'm just gonna pull a little bit of slack here and then just loop it around this U post one more time and then adjust the flowers to fill in where I want them to fill in. You can even bring this twine up like I'm doing right now to keep the support higher, which will keep these branches upright. So now you can see it's leaning this way. By tomorrow, the sun will help them actually reorient and then they'll lean forward again. But now this looks a lot more tidy and compact and we can move over to this cucumber trellis here, which could use a little bit of pruning and a little bit of harvesting. Here we are down in the cucumber row where we have some harvesting and pruning to do here. So this is a variety called Katrina over here. This is a greenhouse cucumber. It's actually one that's been bred to be parthenocopic, which is actually a genetic factor that means that it doesn't need to be pollinated to produce fruit. So this can produce fruit inside a greenhouse without any pollinators present. It'll just keep cranking out cucumbers day after day, all night long. So this has actually been quite fun for me. It's a more expensive seed because it is a greenhouse variety, but it has been producing nonstop cucumbers. I think I've already harvested maybe a dozen off this plant and it's not that big. So it's quite a good haul so far. I just pulled three off and I see another six or seven on this plant alone. Now, when it comes to pruning cucumbers, there are a lot of different rules. The one that I've been trying to practice this year is I believe called the umbrella method, which is where you actually prune your cucumber vine down to only have maybe a liter or two. And then from there, once that cucumber reaches the top of your trellis, you just let it fall down and create an umbrella of more cucumbers. This gives you the advantage of getting up to that height very early, gives you a lot of airflow early on where disease might be a problem. And then once it's up top, you could just let it rip and it'll produce a ton of cucumbers because it's been storing up a lot of energy as it's been growing. So what I'm doing now is pruning off any of these leaves and any sort of suckers that are growing along the ground here, just to keep things tidy and as disease free as possible. Oh, there's another cucumber to harvest right there. Nice, perfect cucumber. These are kind of more akin to the Persian style cucumbers where you can eat the whole skin and it's not bitter at all. So very tasty salad cucumber. And I think I'm going to leave this uh, quote unquote sucker here because it has a cucumber on it, but I will remove the other trailing bit. And that's looking pretty good. I'm going to move my way down to this side. We have a different cucumber variety. So let's switch sides. Over on this side, we have a younger cucumber that is now struggling to get up onto the trellis. So what I'm going to do here is help it by weaving it through this netting and allow it to have some height. If it doesn't get tall enough early, it's just going to suffer from lack of sunlight that's going to stop it from giving us all that harvest that we want. Now this cucumber on the end here is the Boothby's Blonde. It is a yellow cucumber, so it's not a green style. It stays yellow and kind of blondish color throughout. And they're quite crispy and make a delicious pickle. The other cucumber I have right here is the Tasty Green, which is a wonderful salad cucumber from Botanical Interest. Here is actually one of the harvest. I've picked out maybe three or four of these already and the plant's not that big. So I'm very pleased with that one. This has been a very good cucumber year so far. Oh, I see a problem here. And actually also another harvest. So there's the normal one. And here's the problem. So when you see a cucumber that looks like this, where it has this kind of uniform, or sorry, lack of uniformity and its thickness and shape, this is usually due to inconsistent watering. So what happened here was that I probably just wasn't running my irrigation on a regular schedule. When this cucumber started forming, it got hit by a heat wave and it basically pinched off here and then I watered it, which allowed it to swell again. So if you have cucumbers that look like this, it's because you're not watering consistently and they're just suffering through heat waves with lack of water. A great way to reduce this is of course to water more consistently, but also applying a thick layer of mulch helps keep that water trapped in 
it helps stop them from forming these weird cucumbers. Nothing wrong with it, you could still eat it. I'm gonna just remove it because it already looks weird and it's not that big. So I'm not gonna get much more out of it. All right, that's enough cucumber talk for one day. Now let's go over to the chop and drop bed where I'm finally going to be planting into it and you'll see exactly how much it's broken down and what I'm going to be putting there in place of the eggplant. If there is one video that really shocked me on how well it did this year, it is my chop and drop vlog. You guys were absolutely all over the idea of chop and drop and wanted to know more about it. So I figured let's plant into it today. Here we are with some peppers and some flowers, but first we got to do a reveal here. So I'm going to remove the burlap for the last time, unless we want to just use it as sheet mulch, which we could, I guess. And let's see what we have. So what I'm looking at right here is basically nothing. It's just all turned into mulch. This is the remains of the fava bean. It's just a dried husk of its former self. And if I dig into the actual bed itself, it looks like incredibly rich soil with absolutely no signs of fava beans in there. And probably the best looking soil I have in my property right now. Now we know that this chop and drop has been a success. It's fully broken down, ready to be planted in. So let's put some peppers in the ground. I wanted to quickly point out though, in case you're wondering why these don't look so good. These are all my leftover spring starts. So they're all from March. They're quite old. I haven't been potting them up, just been kind of stringing them along, waiting for their home and unwilling to commit a home for them. So now we found their forever home. We're gonna put them in the ground. We're going to plant them at about a foot spacing apart. So what I'm using here is a carpenter's ruler. I think that's what it's called. And the cool thing about these is that every six inches, you could actually articulate the ruler and fold it into different shapes. And in this case, what I've done is I've folded into two triangles where every single point here is a foot apart. So now this is going to be my spacing guide to put these peppers in the ground. And in between any sort of big blank spots, I'll be popping in a queen lime orange zinnia. These are also quite old, which is why they look a little bit ragged. In terms of the peppers I'm actually planting, I have two tequila sunrise, three orange suns, four escamillos, two scotch bonnets, two padrone peppers. Those are a, a similar kind of pepper to a shishito where sometimes they're hot, but mostly they're not. Now the queen lime orange zinnia over here, which will go in between those blank spots, two lights of peppers, allegedly the sweetest pepper that you could buy, and two what I call Marto peppers, which are home safe seeds from a pepper that my cousin Marto gave me. So let's go ahead and get these in the ground. One foot spacing. I'm gonna start on this side. Put my padrones right here. Queen line zinnia. Now the zinnia here has a flower already and I'm going to be just chopping it right off. This will help branch it up a little better. And also that flower just happening too early. It's not gonna be the right size. It's too small, no reason to keep it. So let's continue planting peppers by putting some escamillos right over here. Escamillo peppers are one of my favorite. They're very large, nice orange color, very sweet, very versatile. You could stuff them, roast them, slice them, eat them in a salad. So I'm definitely going to be planting all four of them that I have here. So now I'm putting in three orange sun peppers. These are a wonderful bell pepper from Botanical Interest. One of my favorite and actually only bell peppers that I've seeked out to grow before. So I'm definitely going to put all three of those. Looks like I have room for five more peppers. So I'm gonna put in two of them as tequila sunrise. I'm gonna put in two Marto peppers and I'll put in one of the sugar rush peach. I already have a couple of sugar rush peach over there. So that's why I'm only putting in one. If you guys wanna see more of these videos where I kind of show you the little things behind the scenes that I don't dedicate a whole video to, definitely let me know down in the comments, but I'm gonna go snack on these cucumbers and I'll see you guys next time.